can you say hi? Say hello. Hello. I love you. I'm sorry I do this to you. Thank you for still loving me. Thank you. Mm, gorgeous girl. Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be looking at another terrible parenting book. This time, I can't remember if this exact one was recommended to me by one of you guys on, I think it was Instagram, but the author definitely was and when I went and looked up the rest of his catalogue, I found this book called Parenting Isn't for Cowards. This is a book written by a Dr. James Dobson and it's another one of those kind of like terrible Christian parenting books that at some point definitely starts to recommend using violence and physical force against your kids, which obviously I am completely against. Now again, disclaimer as always, before I make any of these videos about parenting books, I don't have kids myself, I never plan on having kids, but I do have a niece and nephew who are fairly young, I think we're talking like, what is it, six or seven and about like two-ish or something now, and I of course have my gorgeous little pup here who I treat like a daughter, and I can't imagine ever using physical violence against any of them, so I am of course, completely against it. Uh, this particular book, Parenting Isn't for Cowards, it was originally published in 1987, but the version we're gonna be looking at and reading today is the kind of updated version published in 2007. So still a little older and outdated, but apparently people are still reading it and using it and taking James's advice. So we're gonna be reviewing it and talking about it today. Today, we're not really looking, thankfully, at any of the more like violent stuff. So if you do feel worried or upset by any of that stuff, don't worry, you can still watch this video today. I'll just make sure I put a warning if we talk about it in future videos. Um, today, he kind of talks more about the, um, I guess the background of being a parent and why he believes children behave the way they do. And this has some really interesting stuff in it because he talks a lot about like free will and why we think why he thinks we have free will. But there's a hell of a lot of like flaws in his logic and arguments. And this whole question of whether we have free will or not is a very, very interesting and important one. And one which deserves a lot more discussion than we can give it in this video. But I'm gonna try and touch on some of the basic concepts and ideas and point out a couple of the flaws in James's argument before we go on to discuss the rest of the book in other videos because this is essentially the, the kind of foundation that he has for everything else he goes on to write about in his book. This stuff we're talking about today is his foundation for why he thinks it's okay to beat kids and so on. So let's just have a read of this book, talk about it and... Um, Go, go from there. <laughs> Chapter one is titled The Challenge and opens with James writing, have you noticed being a good parent seems to become more difficult in recent years. It never has been all that easy, of course. For one thing, babies come into the world with no instructions and you pretty much have to assemble them on your own. Now I can't comment about like parenting getting more difficult or whatever, but yeah, I'm gonna agree with him. Parenting seems like one of the most difficult things you can do in life. It's not something I ever want to do and I don't envy the people who do it. In fact, I have a lot of respect for the people who do it and can do it well, you know, so I understand how difficult it is and I'm not here to say, oh, you're all doing it wrong, blah, 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 you know, it should be easy, me, 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 me. That's not what I'm here to do. Not at all what I'm saying, so let's clear that up now. He goes on to write, many parents do not understand this frustr frustrating aspect of child rearing because they have never experienced it. Through no great achievement of their own, they manage to produce a house full of easy children. My wife and I are acquainted with a family like that. They were blessed with three of the most perfect children you are likely to find. All three made straight A's in schools, kept their rooms perpetually clean, were musically talented, ate with one hand in their laps, were first team athletes, spoke politely and correctly to adults, and even had teeth that didn't need straightening. It was almost disgusting to see how well they turned out. Predictably, our friends awarded themselves complete credit for, their for the success of their children. They were also inclined at the drop of a hat to tell you how to raise yours. Overconfidence oozed from their fingertips. This, this whole little bit kind of like rubs me the wrong way a bit because like don't belittle your friends their achievements. Even if you don't think they did anything as parents, they clearly did. And I don't think it's a bad thing for them to be proud of raising good children. That's something to be praised and give them credit for, not to say, oh well, they were lucky enough to have these great children, but it was none of their doing because they were born that way. Because that's the argument he goes on to make here, and I just find it a little bit disgusting. Let's give credit where credit is due, you know? But, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little more about this in detail as we go on with this video, so don't worry. The other thing, though, that I do want to mention is just because these kids seemed perfect and 
great on the surface, that doesn't mean that family didn't have their fair share of struggles and difficulties behind the scenes, you know? And then he goes on to write, and God knows why he sounds so happy about this bit. But then an interesting thing happened. The Lord, who must have a sense of humour, gift-wrapped a little tornado and sent it as a surprise package on the mother's 40th birthday. That family has been stumbling backwards ever since. Their little caboose, who is now six years old, is as tough as nails and twice as sharp. He loves to fight with his parents and already knows considerably more than they. Just ask him, he'll tell you. The funny thing about his parents is that they quit giving child re rearing advice shortly after his birth. Their job suddenly got harder. So here he is celebrating the fact that, you know, the, these parents who they did a great job raising their first three kids and they thought they were done and they were happy, suddenly had a surprise baby when the mum turned 40. And this is a lot like my parents. My mum was like 38 when she had me. It was like 10 years after my brother was born and I was a little surprised. And, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that they're finding child rearing difficult with this last child because they're a lot older and they don't have that same energy that they had when they were younger, probably. Socially, like everything is, you know, a lot of time has passed and things can be different and other parents might expect different things of them rules for getting kind of like child minders and getting into nurseries and schools and all that stuff might be different. I can understand why having a child a lot later than your others, especially when you're older, is going to be more difficult for them. It's not something to laugh about and mock them for and be like, ha ha ha, this told them. This proves that it's all in, you know, the, the child and nothing to do with how you raise it or something, something I don't know words and stuff. The point is I don't really like seeing him kind of revel in this family's, not necessarily misery, but difficulties. In the least appealing description of parenting of all time, James goes on to write, parenthood can certainly be humiliating at times. It also seems specifically des designed to irritate us. Tell me why it is that a toddler never throws up in a bathroom. Never! To do so would violate some great unwritten law of the universe. It is even more difficult to understand why he will gag violently at the sight of a perfectly wonderful breakfast of oatmeal, eggs, bacon and orange juice, and then go out and drink the dog's water. I have no idea what makes him do that. I only know that it drives his mother crazy. Yet another reason, I never want to be a parent. And this is where things get kind of really odd, right? Because he starts saying how, like, now he thinks parents have it more difficult than they used to, or do just listen to this bit, right, okay. I'm quite certain that parents in the past decades spent less energy worrying about their children. They had other things on their mind. I turned to my father and asked, do you remember worrying about me when I was a kid? How do you feel about these pressures associated with being a fa father? Dad was rather embarrassed by the line of questioning. He smiled sheepishly and said, honestly, Bo, his pet name for me, I never really gave that a thought. His answer reflected the time in which I grew up. People worried about the depression that was just ending, the war with Germany and later the Cold War with Russia. They did not invest much effort in hand wringing over their children, at least not until a major problem developed. Trouble was not anticipated. And why not? Because it was easier to raise kids in that era. I attended high school during the happy days of the 1950s and I never saw or even heard of anyone taking an illegal drug. This man led a very sheltered life. It happened, I suppose, but it was certainly no threat to me. Some of the other students liked to get drunk, but alcohol was not a big deal in my social environment. Others played around with sex, but the girls who did were considered loose and were not respected. Virginity was still in style for males and females. Occasionally a girl came up pregnant, but she was packed off in a hurry and I never knew where she went. Homosexuals were very weird and unusual people. I heard there were a few around, but I didn't know them personally. How is he writing all this stuff and referring to it as the happy days, the good old days. Oh, ooh, sorry, I know. Most of my friends respected their parents, went to church on Sunday, studied hard enough to get by, and lived a fairly clean life. There were exceptions, of course, but this was the norm. It's no wonder my parents were concentrating on other anxieties. It's no wonder that parents are more concerned in the present era. Their children are walking through the valley of the shadow. Drugs, sex, alcohol, rebellion, and deviant lifestyles are everywhere. Those dangers have never been so evident to me as they are today. And there we have it. That's like a big cru crux of his entire argument for this book. And whoever is drilling next door, that is very annoying. <laughs> Can you guys hear that? I thought it was going to stop, but no. Oh my god. <sighs> How much further can they even drill? Anyway, sorry. I'm 
genuinely absolutely sick of people blaming society for all of their problems and you know not themselves and not really taking personal responsibility for stuff i'm not saying that you know societal norms changing isn't partly the cause of for example parenting being more hands-on than it used to be perhaps but it's also not the whole story not by any means Maybe parents are more concerned and hands-on with their children now because we, as a society, are learning more about the damage we can do to children when we raise them badly. We're learning more about the importance of good parenting. Without getting into too many specifics, a lot of scientific research has been done since these days in the early 1900s. So we understand the importance of certain kinds of parenting and how we bring up children and, um, you know, we understand the importance of doing certain activities with kids, teaching them certain things, giving them a certain diet, maybe encouraging certain behaviours, spending a certain amount of time with them, and, and so on. And more and more parents are aware of these studies, they're more part of the mainstream now, and that's why more parents are thinking, damn, I don't want to mess up my kids, I'm gonna be more hands-on, I'm gonna worry more, I'm gonna care more. And maybe parents today are more conscious of trying to raise their kids well, because they had parents who basically ignored them growing up and didn't care all that much. And they saw that and they saw how it affected them and they don't want to do that same thing to their own kids. And maybe it is partly to do with societal changes and changes to what our norms and values are. But it's not just one thing. It's definitely a whole range of things all combined and mixed together. And of course, when we say parents in general are more hands-on, that still doesn't mean that everyone is. The other thing is that we're more aware that there are big differences in the kinds of families that are out there now and the way that different people raise kids in different ways and the different ways different families are structured and we're very aware that there's not just one right way to do everything and a lot of it comes down to the individual family and figuring out what's best for the parents, what's best for the kids, what's best on a physical, biological and psychological level, what's good on a kind of social level, like blah. Lots of things come into play and there's not just one right way to do things and I think we're a lot more aware of that now than we used to be. Following on from this point though, James goes on to get mad about London, weirdly. He's an American guy, starts complaining about London. Now, I'll be honest, I kind of took this bit a little bit personally because I lived in London for four, maybe a bit more years and I love the place. I think it's wonderful, it's magical, you meet all kinds of wonderful people there, you have the most incredible experiences. London is an incredible big melting pot of all different kinds of people from all different backgrounds and lifestyles all coming together in one incredible city of opportunity and excitement and I think it's wonderful but James doesn't like it. <laughs> James writes, I'm writing this book in the heart of London where my family has joined me for a couple of months. This wonderful and historic city is also the home of some of the most pitiful young people I've ever seen. I was one of those. I was one of those pitiful young people apparently. <laughs> rockers and punkers and druggies are on the streets in search of something, who knows what. Girls with green and orange and purple hair walk by with strange looking boyfriends. At least, I think they're boys. They wear earrings and have blue mohawk haircuts that stick four inches in the air. While gazing at that sight, a clang, clang, clang sound is heard from the rear. The Harry Krishnas are coming. They dance by with their shaved heads and monk-like robes. Where the hell has he been in London? Gays parade arm in arm and prostitutes advertise their services. <laughs> I'm sorry, but seriously, where in London was James? What part of London was he in? Because I'd like to go there. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, when he was writing this, was he just playing the game of how many people can I offend in one paragraph? Because if so, James, I think you won. I also just like, seriously, how warped is his view if... He thinks the most pitiful people are those who have a few piercings and dyed hair. Like, if that's what he thinks is pitiful, then how sheltered and dull and sheltered and privileged and sheltered is his life? The thing is, when you're in London, there are people who I do feel a lot of pity for, you know, including the, um, seven and a half thousand homeless people who the Conservative government is doing next to nothing to help. Um, I might feel it for the thousands and thousands of families living in poverty who are barely able to feed or clothe their children. I might feel it for the families and friends of the victims of knife crimes and gang violence in London, which is scarily common. While I lived there, um, I saw knife fights in my local park. I saw someone threatening someone who at first seemed to be a friend with a knife at my local DLR station. It, it was a mess. I might feel pity for 
any number of people in London, but not the perfectly normal, happy, functional people who just happen to have green or orange hair, you know? They're not the people worth pitying and wanting to help and change. There are plenty of other people who actually need that help, who actually need you to worry about them. Also, can we talk about that last line there? The um, gays parade arm in arm and prostitutes advertise their services. Sorry, but prostitutes advertising their services happens in pretty much every major city in the world somewhere not just in London. Sex work is one of the oldest professions and one that, let's be realistic, is always gonna have a place in society. That's why the church used to literally be the home of prostitutes. Temple prostitutes were a thing. Um, the only difference is that we're slowly starting to reduce the stigma around sex work in general, which is really, really important because one, sex workers deserve the same respect as everyone else, and two, the more we normalize it, the more we can regulate it, and the more we regulate it, the safer we can make it for those sex workers. That said, I don't really think it's all that obvious in London. Sure, sex work is going on everywhere in the world, but I can't really think of anywhere obvious in London where you just see prostitutes advertising their services. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't think I saw a single prostitute in four years. Um, so I really want to know, where were you staying, James, and why were you staying there? Is there something you want to tell us? I think you'd actually hate where I live in Leeds because I'm um, in Holbeck, which is like the one area of Leeds where prostitution is legal. And I see a lot of prostitutes walking past my building to go to the um, legal area to go work, and most of them lovely women, actually. Um, God, James would hate it. He would absolutely hate it. Anyway, sorry, back to his book and his writing. He then goes on to complain about a friend of his daughter's who was planning to go to university. However, in a completely shocking and disgusting and disturbing twist of events, um, he found out, and the, the, the friend found out, that this university, men and women, share the same dorms. That means in one corridor of people, you have men and women living next door to each other. Disgusting. You wouldn't get that anywhere else on the planet, would you? Definitely not in a block of flats like this. Definitely not on a street where you have men and women living next door to each other. It's revolting, disgusting, should be banned. No, but it's ridiculous, it's so ridiculous. He writes, this is the world in which our children are growing up. Obviously, conservative communities still exist where traditional values are honored. Millions of kids still want to do what is right, but dangerous enticements are there too, and parents know it. Do you know it? Yes, you know it, don't you? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Some live in fear that the dragon of adolescence will consume their sons and daughters before they have even started out in life. That anxiety can really take the pleasure out of raising children. This is so ridiculous, isn't it, Cooper? Yes, it is. I know. He goes on to write, I don't believe that the task of procreation was intended to be so burdensome. Of course it is demanding but modern parents have saddled themselves with unnecessary guilt, fear, and self-doubt. That is not the divine plan. Throughout the scriptures, it is quite clear that the raising of children was viewed as a wonderful blessing from God, a welcome, joyful experience. And today, it remains one of the greatest pleasures in living to bring a baby into the world, a vulnerable little human who, <laughs> a vulnerable little human being who looks to us for all his needs. What a wonderful opportunity it is to teach these little ones to love God with all their heart and to serve their fellow man throughout their lives. There is no higher calling than that. Oh my God, he's right. I've changed my mind. I'm going to drop everything and start indoctrinating children. That is the highest honour in life. Isn't it, Kubi? Isn't it? Shall I indoctrinate you? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Time for a little bit of brainwashing. Shall we brainwash you? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. And with that, we are moving on to chapter two, titled The Tough and the Gentle. James writes, you are not alone. Millions of parents, past and present, can identify with the particular stresses you are experiencing right now. A child between 18 and 36 months of age is a sheer delight, but he can also be utterly maddening. Which actually I think is quite a reassuring statement and I think it's a good one to have in this book and it's probably something that a lot of parents want to hear, knowing that they're not alone and... Yeah, callsies. And then he goes on to talk about how there are innate different kinds of children, uh, some who are innately compliant and some who aren't. And this is where he really starts to lose me in 
this book. Oh, Baba, my little demanding one. I don't know if you can see this on camera, but every time I stop patting her, she pats me on the back. And she said, carry on, Mum. Carry on. So, um, to read a little bit more about what James says, and this is quite a long bit, but it's important, I think. The distinction between them is not a matter of confidence, willingness to take a risk, sparkling personality, or other desirable characteristics. Rather, the issue under consideration is focused on the strength of the will, the inclination of some children to resist authority and determine their own course, as compared with those who are willing to be led. It is my supposition that these temperaments are pre-packaged before birth and do not have to be cultivated or encouraged. They will make themselves known soon enough. Not everyone concurs. Many psychologists and psychiatrists of the past would have disagreed violently with this understanding. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, and J.B. Watson, the creator of behaviorism, believed that newborns come into the world as blank slates on which the environment would later write. For them, a baby had no inborn characteristics of personality that disting distinguished them from other infants. Everything he would become, both good and evil, would result from the experiences to be provided by the world around him. He could make no independent decisions because he had no real freedom of choice, no ability to consider his circumstances and act rationally on them. Watson bragged during the 1920s that he could train any infant to become any type of specialist I might select, doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, and yes, even beggarman and thief. He thought children were simply raw material for parents to fashion in ways to suit themselves. In short, this belief that all behaviour is caused is called determinism and it will have significance for us in later discussions. I first heard the concept when I was in graduate school. I didn't accept it then and I certainly don't believe it now. As a Christian psychologist, I have always filtered man-made theories through the screen of scripture. And in this instance, determ determinism hangs up in the wire. If this were true, we would be unable to worship and serve God as voluntarily as a voluntary expression of our love. We would be mere puppets on a string responding to the stimuli around us. I know it was a lot to read and take in, but this is where James starts talking about this idea of free will and this idea, well, well his, uh, his ideas are very complicated and there's a hell of a lot to unpack in this. I think it's important we try and at least start to unpack a little bit and talk about it and dissect it and, okay. There's a lot of thoughts I have here and I want to try and get them across properly. So one of the first things that I found very interesting about this that is worth talking about is that this last paragraph here about as a Christian psychologist shows to me that James is quite biased and flawed in how he comes to his conclusions. Shows me he's putting what he wants to believe about religion, i.e. that worship has a purpose, ahead of what significant scientific studies suggest. And that's a huge, huge problem. Now, I wouldn't say I'm a full-on determinist, but I definitely lean more that way than I do towards the whole, yes, we definitely have free will side of things. But I do think it's all a lot more complex than black and white thinking of either all of our decisions are in our control or none of them are. I don't think it's one or the other necessarily. I want to try and explain kind of my view and understanding of this whole thing um, as simply as possible. Um, I'm not going to use any big words because I want everyone to be able to like follow on and understand me um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail but brief overview. When we look at something like a human being's personality and behaviour, who they are, I would say it's arguably partially determined by our genetics and partially determined by our upbringing and also determined by our continued ongoing growth and the world around us and you know all the stimuli around us and everything right however the genetic components aren't necessarily set in stone the genetic component components are more like guidelines to guide us down a certain path but you know they're, they're more likely to make us predisposed to act or react in certain ways but we can still change our actual behaviors kind of overwrite them to a certain extent or at least some of them I think so so if you guys might know this but our nervous system has kind of different parts right some we control unconsciously like the parts that keep our heart beating for example or that give us goosebumps when we're cold and um, sometimes we can override the normally unconscious parts like when we take conscious control of our breathing for example 
but the other part of our nervous system is conscious and we kind of consciously control what happens like when we think about lifting our hand and we lift it or we think about moving our mouth or we think about wanting to speak and so we move our mouth to speak every kind of action and reaction and thing that happens to us has essentially a neural pathway so an outside stimuli will pick up something and then certain types of neurons will kind of collect that information take it to the brain or the spinal cord or part of the nervous system or whatever and then the information will be often processed in some way and then sent out to another part of the body that responds if that makes sense so these are kind of like neural pathways right and a lot of them are kind of interconnected and it's all quite complex but over time the more we use a certain neural pathway the more we build up connections in there and so the response time is faster like the more we use a neural pathway the quicker it gets if that makes sense so for example a person might see a visual stimuli of a ball coming towards them and that's picked up by receptors in the eye information then travels from the eye to the brain and then the brain processes the information and tells you to move your arm to catch the ball and the more you practice that the more you use that neural pathway the quicker your responses will be. Until soon, the brain doesn't necessarily need to consciously process, move your arm. It kind of immediately thinks, I see ball, move arm, without consciously thinking about it, if that makes sense. <laughs> Basically, the more times you do it, the faster you'll be at catching that ball. And this also can kind of be applied to like emotional responses and other kind of behavioral responses. Okay, let me, let me give you an example, right? Okay, we're pretty certain now that things like anxiety and depression and other mental health issues like that do have some kind of genetic component, right? So I, as an individual, am almost, de am almost definitely genetically predisposed to have issues with depression and anxiety. And I know this because it runs in my family. Several other family members have very, very similar issues to me. So when I was in school and used to get bullied pretty badly, my brain would immediately go into panic mode. I'd cry, I'd breathe faster, my head would feel kind of loud, there would be a lot of pressure in there because that was kind of, for one, what I was more genetically predisposed to respond with. But then the more it happened, the more my nervous system got used to dealing with stressful stimuli in this way. And there was no one there to tell me that I could control it or stop it or change it. And so it got to the point where it didn't necessarily take something big like bullying to send me into a panic attack. But my brain got so used to responding in this way to emotional stress that eventually any small amount of confrontation or stress would send me into a full on panic attack. Because that was, because while I had that genetic component predisposing me to that, I kind of went through using those neural pathways the stronger they got and the stronger that response became. It wasn't really until I started working with a CBT counsellor and I started consciously um, trying to like pick apart my actions and follow the triggers and understand how to slow down and ultimately how to change my neural pathways and behaviours that I stopped having so many panic attacks. I mean they still happen sometimes but not half as bad as they used to and not half as frequently as they used to. And so I guess this is a good example of what my viewpoint is because we're genetically predisposed to act, react and behave in certain ways but that doesn't always mean we have to react, act and behave in these ways. A lot of our behaviour and responses are learnt. We copy the people we see around us, we learn from others, we use certain neural pathways more than others. Sometimes we choose to, sometimes because there's a genetic predisposition um, but we can also identify and change those pathways which aren't helpful to us and we can try and teach ourselves to use new ones. I'd still argue that a lot of our responses and behaviours on a certain level are out of our control. We don't necessarily have conscious control of the specific electrochemical reactions which are happening in our nervous systems. These are an unconscious response to other stimuli but sometimes we can manipulate our brains into paying more attention to certain stimuli and not others and so on. So I wouldn't say we have no free will and that we're purely, I guess, slaves to outside stimuli, but I also wouldn't say we have complete free will either. 
That said, I know there are some people who have made very interesting, if not completely convincing arguments for free will, but James's isn't one of them. I find his particular argument for free will really, really odd, because let's go back and take another look at what he was saying, right? And let's kind of break things apart a little more. As a Christian psychologist, I've always filtered man-made theories through the screen of scripture, and in this instance, determinism hangs up in the wire. So this is a huge red flag to start with for me, because yes, scientists scientific hypotheses as hypotheses scientific hypotheses should be tested and looked at objectively i think that's something we can all agree on we shouldn't accept them without sufficient evidence and we should be willing to change them and adapt them later based on new ev evidence that we receive however the kind of evidence that we should be using should be objective and independent and scripture is not objective independent evidence Scripture and all the claims made in the Bible are not evidence, but simply other theories and hypotheses because they were made by man. And scripture itself is a claim that needs testing. If the Bible claims God made the world in seven days, we should be saying, okay, where is the proof for or against this? Not saying, well, um, carbon dating suggests the earth or this rock or whatever is this many years old, but scripture says seven days, so... Scripture itself is a claim that needs testing, not a piece of objective evidence that we can test other claims against. But the big problem that I have is that ultimately James's idea is that God gave us these innate personalities that mean we're going to behave in certain ways and therefore we have free will. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. And it's incredibly flawed. So basically James thinks if we're born without like innate personalities given by God, and we are, I guess, able to be influenced or controlled or changed in some way by our environments. James writes, if it were true, we would be unable to worship and serve God as a voluntary expression of our love. We would be mere puppets on a string responding to the stimuli around us, which is true, I guess, but you're just describing an inevitable consequence here and not giving any reason or evidence as to why the claim that we don't have free will is true or not. Just because a certain outcome may be favourable to you, that doesn't mean you can discount evidences that go against the outcome you want. Basically, James is saying, I want to worship God, and if we don't have free will, then we can't really worship God. Therefore, we definitely have free will to worship God. And that's just not a sound argument by any means. He, he goes on to write, a blob of tissue, a blank slate, a mass of protoplasm. Hardly. Individual differences in temperament can be discerned at birth or shortly thereafter. But that's just a little too much black, old, black and white thinking for me. Again, I think blank slate is a bit of an exaggeration. I mean, everyone is influenced by their genetics, which make them more likely to behave in certain ways. But also we are affected and changed by our upbringing, our environment, everything. So yes, while a baby's personality can be, you know, noticed at birth, that doesn't mean they're not at all influenced by their environment growing up. And that doesn't mean their personality isn't gonna change and develop and grow. It's kind of confusing, but James thinks our personality is defined and assigned before birth, and yet we have free will, but it's like predetermined free will, which just seems all kind of backwards and weird to me and doesn't really make much sense. I don't know. And if we follow James's logic that God assigns us a personality, but also free will, I don't know, there's no real like genetic or biological explanation or evidence for how any of this would occur. How does he give us a personality that is assigned that we can't really change and yet still gives us free will. That doesn't make sense. There's no like scientific explanation for how that could happen. Like surely if we actually had this predetermined personality that we couldn't change, then surely that would also mean that our responses to outside stimuli would be predetermined and unchangeable and therefore we wouldn't have free will. Surely the only way to have free will is if our personalities weren't determined before birth and were just the result of random genetic, like, of essentially partly randomly, like, assigned genetic codes and natural responses to stimuli. I don't know. I just find every argument I read for free will is incredibly flawed. Maybe I'm missing something, but I just, I don't, 
think it makes sense. <sighs> anyway, sorry, I don't know. James just kind of skims over these big glaring issues of this theory and then never gives any actual evidence for it except one example, which is incredibly flawed because his only evidence comes from the Bible, in which he says, in one remarkable scripture reference, we even see references to a strong-willed temperament before the child is born. Genesis 16.11 reports a striking conversation between an angel of the Lord and Abraham's pregnant servant girl, Hagar. He said, You are now with child, and you will have a son. You will name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility towards all his brothers. And apparently that is proof that God assigns personality before birth, and therefore we have free will. Makes no sense, right? Exactly. And that's where we're actually going to end this review today. In the next video, I want to actually skip forward a bit to chapter five, in which we actually get some parenting advice because James tells us how he deals with strong-willed children. It's, you know what, we'll, we'll cover that in the next video because this is already kind of long enough. But I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this, particularly on the kind of free will debate. I'd love you to let me know down in the comments, do you think we have free will or not? And why? What evidence do you have for your point of view? And like I said before, I don't think the Bible is evidence. I'd like some actual kind of like science or logical evidence as to why you believe things one way or another, if that's possible. And um, also I'd love to know like, how you think James's logic works here in that God predetermines personality and therefore because it's all predetermined we have free will. How does he make that jump? What am I missing there? What logic or reason or explanation am I missing that would make that make sense in any kind of world? Please let me know down in the comments below. Also because I know I have quite a few parents watching me um, and people with younger siblings, I'd love to know um, at what point do you think you kind of saw certain aspects of a child you know's personality come out and how did that change or develop or grow as the child got older? That's another thing I'd love to hear about. Uh, tell me your experiences below. Um, but for now, thank you so much for watching today. I appreciate it so much. I also just want to like final note to this video on a little bit of a mushy sentimental note, but I've been going through a really tough time lately and a few of you guys kind of know why this is and I shared a little bit about it over on my Instagram and kind of, it's, it's hard, but a lot of you reached out and kind of shared your experiences with me and told me your stories as well. And I just want to say thank you to everyone because it is making me feel a lot less alone. And while it's horrible to hear that other people have gone through the same things that I went through, it's very, very um, comforting for me to know that so many of you guys were strong enough and wonderful enough to get through it. And it kind of makes me feel that I can as well. And Kind of, I feel like we're, we're all in it together and I just wanted to kind of extend a thank you to everyone for being so kind and lovely and supportive. So sorry if that sounds really vague and whatever, I, just, I, don't, I don't want to get into the details right now but I just want to say thank you and um, I'm going to end this here. So see you in another video very soon. I hope you're all having a wonderful December and please stay safe and look after yourself and I'll see you again very soon. Also, Koopy's asleep behind me but she says bye as well. <laughs>